Akaya Jaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Shrimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Prechadine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our uh, study of uh, Bhagavad Gita at the level of Bhakti Shastri and today we're on chapter 18 and this should be the final class on Bhagavad Gita. So, uh, let's see, we have, I'll share the screen. Um, there was one thing I wanted to show you. Okay, so oh, I showed you this yesterday, right? The summary of the chapters, right? We saw that. The relationship with you see. Mm hmm. Yeah, there was one more thing. We want to show this summary of the 18th chapter. Can you see it? Yes, Marjorie. You're able to see it? The breakdown of the 18th chapter. No in a clear form. So the first section was about karma yoga. Remember Arjuna began, he wanted to know about sannyas and chyaga and Lord Krishna explained how sacrifice, charity and penance cannot be given up even by great souls. So that was all on karma yoga and then 13 to 18, jnana yoga, we heard about the five factors which influence action and the most important one was the super soul. Then the next section, 19 to 40, was describing the three modes and how the three modes influence knowledge and understanding and the worker and action, everything. And then we went on to prescribe duties and we spoke about the different qualities of devotees and according to their different varna and if they do their prescribed duties on behalf of the Lord in Krishna consciousness then that becomes karma yoga. They give the fruit of their work for the satisfaction of the Lord that is karma yoga. And after hearing about karma yoga then we heard about jnana yoga. The jnana yogi, remember all those qualities about uh, going into, being alone, being, finding a place of solitude and uh, practicing non-violence and being very peaceful and controlling the mind and senses. This was the, the behavior or the qualities cultivated by the jnana yogi. 
And the goal of the jnana yogi is to come to the Brahman, to become Brahma Buddha, to realize that they're not the body and to be fully detached from all sorts of sense gratification. So we stop there at verse uh, 54 or 55. We heard about Brahma Buddha Prasanatma, right? One on the platform of Brahman that is a joyful soul. And so today we're going to go on, we're going to hear this final section about uh, devotion. Verses 56 up to 66 describing the path of bhakti. And then four verses, 67 up to 71, Lord Krishna stresses about, talks about people who distribute that knowledge, who give it to others, that they're very dear to him. So Lord Krishna encourages all of us to preach. And then the final section, we will hear how Arjuna is fixed and Sanjay predicts victory. Okay, so that's the summary of the main sections in the 18th chapter. Is it all right? Any question? Okay, we'll go on. We'll go ahead. We're at uh, 55. Oh, 54, right? Describes one on the platform of Brahman. That is a joyful soul, prasanatma, not hankering for anything or lamenting about anything, sees everyone equally. And in this way, he's, he attains pure devotional service unto the Supreme Lord. So then 55, is, the next verse is also a very, very important verse. Lord Krishna is describing how devotional service can qualify us to understand the Supreme Lord. Bhaktiyamam abhijanati. One can understand me as I am, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, only by devotional service. And when one is in full consciousness of me, by such devotion, he can enter into the kingdom of God. So, this is a, a key verse in the Bhagavad Gita often quoted, that we can understand Krishna by devotional service. We cannot understand Krishna by the power of our own mind, just simply by speculation. And Prabhupada quotes from chapter 7, Naham Prakasha Sarvatma, that I am never manifest to the foolish and the unintelligent. For them I am covered by my Yogamaya potency. So, just reading a little bit from this first paragraph here. No one can understand God simply by erudite scholarship or mental speculation. Only one who is actually engaged in Krishna consciousness and devotional service can understand what Krishna is. University degrees are not helpful. University degrees can help us to understand the language, help us to understand some things, but cannot help us to, cannot qualify us with devotion. So then Prabhupada explains about the significance of becoming Brahman. This is important to understand. You can see here in the second paragraph, Becoming Brahman does not mean that one loses his identity. Devotional service is there. As long as devotional service exists, there must be God, the devotee, and the process of devotional service. So, impersonalists, they think 
a liberation to be the goal, and with liberation they think they will merge into the oneness of Brahman and lose their identity, give up their identity. They think this identity is just their illusion. But Lord Krishna has already said in the Bhagavad Gita that we will always exist. Srila Prabhupada explains, liberation involves getting free from the concept of material life. In spiritual life, the same distinction is there, the same individuality is there, but in pure Krishna consciousness. So it's good to get free from the concept of material life, but we should understand that there is spiritual life and there's personality, there's individuality within the spiritual world. This is not understandable by the impersonalists. So, Srila Prabhupada goes on to explain more. The, the key word which is uh, often misunderstood here, you can see in text 55 it said, Vishate tat anantaram. Vishate tato mam tat vato gyadva. Vishate tat anantaram. And Vishate means, uh, the meaning of Vishate is he enters. So the impersonalists think, aha, he enters. And they think this means you enter in to something, into the Brahman and you lose your identity, you merge. To give the example, just like when you make halava. When you make halava, you have suji and you have butter and you have sugar and water and it's all mixed together and it all just merges, right? And it becomes a halava. You don't, you can't find sugar. You can't find the butter, it's all merged in. So they think Brahman is like that, that you use your, you lose your individuality. So we'll read this section, an important section. Prabhupada said, one should not mistakenly think that the word vishate enters into me, supports the monist theory that one becomes that one becomes homogeneous with the impersonal Brahman. No, Vishate means that one can enter into the abode of the Supreme Lord in one's individuality to engage in his association and render service unto him. For instance, a green bird enters a green tree, not to become one with the tree, but to enjoy the fruits of the tree. It's a very good example. You know, when we're in Vrindavan, we often see the green parrots. And the green parrots, they go into the green tree and you just lose them. So the impersonalists imagine that liberation is something like that, that you lose your individuality. But Prabhupada said, no, the bird goes into the tree, the bird is still in the tree, still has his individuality. Uh, then Prabhupada explains more, impersonalists generally give the example of a river flowing into the ocean and merging. Right? This is it. another example which impersonalists are fond of. They say, just like all the rivers flow into the sea and become one with the sea, so we should all become one with the Supreme, with the Brahman, and just merge, lose our individuality. So Prabhupada explains here that uh, the rivers flow into the sea, but, uh, uh, how does Prabhupada said, this may be a source of happiness for the impersonalist, but the personalist keeps his personal individuality, like an aquatic in the ocean. We find so many living entities within the ocean if we go deep. Surface acquaintance with the ocean is not sufficient. One must have complete knowledge of the aquatics living in the ocean depths. So it's, a, it's an important example and you should know how to counter it. If someone talks about rivers flowing into the sea and becoming one with the sea, you have to explain to them, yes, but within the ocean there are many living entities and they all have their individuality. 
it's not that everything is just simply one. Within the ocean there are so many different creatures and they keep their individuality. And we should understand similarly in the spiritual world there is individuality. There is of course there's a, the impersonal Brahman which is like a, a merging or a oneness. But even in the Brahman one has his individuality. And when one leaves the impersonal Brahman, he maintains that individuality. We never give up our identity. We're always spirit souls. But we just exist on different levels of consciousness, in different places, in different circumstances. But we're always individuals. So this is an important example to present to impersonalists and trying to expose their mistaken understandings. All right? Uh, is this example clear to everyone? Okay, good. Maharaj, just uh, like if the impersonalists, they, they say they are like the rivers, you know, they consider themselves as the river and merging into the ocean, and that becomes one. So how, how can, of course, we have, we have explained us that the aquatics are there, but the water, it becomes one. So that's what they are always arguing on it. Yes. The becoming one. They give the example of the water becoming one, but the, the water is not the best example to compare to the living entities. That's, in presenting an example, you have to consider how many points of similarity are there. The, the fact is we are all living entities and we are individuals. We have our personal identities. They cannot deny that. So when you, when you present an example, you have to consider how many points are actually appropriate. They simply talk about the, the, the water becoming one. But even the water, you can see the water in the river is different from the water in the sea. The water in the sea is salt water. River water is not salty. There's a difference. There's some difference. It's not that it's all, all one, all the same. So, generally we have to be careful in dealing with these people who have these different philosophies. It's very difficult to argue with them. What we like to do with them, the best way to preach to them is give them prasada and kirtan, the chanting of the holy name. The more they're willing to take prasada and to chant the holy name, then gradually they will be ready to hear. If they come with all their impersonal philosophies just to argue, we don't want to waste their time arguing with them. It's not a good idea because they're not ready to hear. If people are not open to hearing, why waste time? Better to just ask them to chant the holy name, take prasadam. Okay, now, uh, okay, we'll go ahead, text 56. Though engaged in all kinds of activities, my pure devotee, under my protection, reaches the eternal and imperishable abode by my grace. So Lord Krishna describes the nature of his abode, right? Mat prasad avapnoti shasvatam padam avyayam. The nature of the Lord's abode, that it is shasvatam, eternal, and avyayam, imperishable. When we speak about you know, the word that's there, the, the, my devotee, under my protection, 
by my mercy, you know, it indicates some personal exchanges there. Lord Krishna is talking, under my protection, by my mercy, mat prasada, my mercy. So Krishna, he has feelings for his devotees. And the devotee, of course, has feeling for Krishna. So Srila Prabhupada explains here in the purport, to a devotee who is thus engaged in Krishna consciousness, the Lord is very, very kind, right? Because the devotee is so fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, 24 hours a day, he's engaged in devotional activities. So, in spite of all difficulties, he is eventually placed in the transcendental abode of Krishna Loka. He is guaranteed entrance there. There is no doubt about it. In that supreme abode, there is no change. Everything is eternal, imperishable, and full of knowledge. Text 57. Someone could read? In all activities, just depend upon me and work always under my protection. In such devout service, be fully conscious of me. Yes. Thank you. So, Srila Prabhupada explains, now may, one, now one may argue that Arjuna was acting under the personal direction of Krishna. But when Krishna is not present, how should one act? So Prabhupada explains, if one acts according to the direction of Krishna in this book, as well as under the direction of the representative of Krishna, then the result will be the same. Quite reasonable. Krishna's teaching and Krishna's representative give the same instruction as Krishna. The Sanskrit word matpara is very important in this verse. It indicates that one has no goal in life save and accept acting in Krishna consciousness just to satisfy Krishna. And while working in that way, one should think of Krishna only. Then Prabhupada tells us how we should think of Krishna. I have been appointed to discharge this particular duty by Krishna. While acting in such a way, one naturally has to think of Krishna. This is perfect Krishna consciousness. We should think, Krishna has given me this service, I should do it. So, sometimes, just like Arjuna, his service was to fight. Krishna gave him that service. Of course, it was not easy. He had to fight against relatives and people who he respected. But Krishna wanted him to do it. Then Prabhupada continues, one should, one should, however, note that after doing something whimsically, he should not offer the result to the Supreme Lord. That sort of duty is not in the devotional service of Krishna consciousness. One should act according to the order of Krishna. This is a very important point. That order of Krishna comes through disciplic succession from the bona fide spiritual master. Therefore, spiritual master's order should be taken as the prime duty of life. If one gets a bona fide spiritual master and acts according to his direction, then one's perfection of life in Krishna consciousness is guaranteed. So Srila Prabhupada is encouraging all of us to be faithful to the orders, instructions which we receive from the spiritual teachers and simply by following them 
then we can please Krishna and we can get the success of life. Okay, we'll go ahead, text 58. Someone like to read translation? of me, you will pass over all the obstacles of conditioned life by my grace. However, you do not work in such consciousness, but act through false ego. Not hearing me, you will be lost. Hmm. So Lord Krishna describes the results of hearing properly and not hearing when you don't act according to the instruction, what happens? All right? For, for one who acts in Krishna consciousness, Lord Krishna becomes the most intimate friend. He always looks after his friend's comfort and he gives himself to his friend who is so devotedly engaged, working 24 hours a day to please the Lord. But then at the end of the purport, Prabhupada said, one should note very carefully that one who is not active in Krishna consciousness is losing himself in the material whirlpool, in the ocean of birth and death. So we have that choice. It's up to us how we act. We want to surrender to Krishna or not. We will see Krishna is telling Arjuna, now what are you going to do? And anyway, text 59, Lord Krishna describes If you do not act according to my direction and do not fight, then you will be falsely directed. By your nature, you will have to be arrogant in <laughs> Arjuna was thinking not to fight, but Krishna tells him here, <laughs> it's your nature, you will have to fight, you're going to fight. Whether, whether you do it for me or not, you're going to fight. It's, it's an interesting point. Lord Krishna understands the nature of Arjuna. His nature was to be a military, he was a military man. His nature was to be a Kshatriya. So his duty was to fight. But he's thinking, no, my teacher, my grandfather, my relatives, how can I fight them? So actually, Prabhupada said, actually he was considering himself master of his actions as if he were directing the good and bad results of such work. He forgot that the Supreme Personality of Godhead was present there, instructing him to fight. And so this is an interesting point, that uh, Arjuna should fight. It's not because, not because, uh, it, because it was his duty, that was not the reason why he should fight. Arjuna shouldn't, and he shouldn't fight just because uh, the, these Kauravas had done so many bad things to them and cheated them out of the kingdom. But the real reason why Arjuna should fight was for Krishna, that he should do it for Krishna. And that's what Krishna wants him to do. He wants Arjuna to fight because he wants him to do it. And in this way Arjuna gets perfection, or shows, Arjuna shows his perfection. Prabhupada explains, the Supreme Personality of Godhead gives direction as to what is good and what is bad. And one simply has to act in Krishna consciousness to attain the perfection of life. No one can ascertain his destiny as the Supreme Lord can. 
Therefore, the best course is to take direction from the Supreme Lord and act. No one should neglect the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or the order of the spiritual master who is the representative of God. One should act unhesitatingly to execute the order of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That will keep one safe under all circumstances. So it's following the order of Krishna. That's the important point. No other reason why Arjuna should fight. We said everything was going on well. Duryodhan was doing a good job. No, yeah, they cheated the Pandavas out of the kingdom, but that wasn't why Arjuna should fight. Arjuna should fight because Krishna wants him to do it. So Lord Krishna wants Arjuna's motivation to be like that. He wants it. Arjuna's motivation is... He wants to do it to please the Supreme Lord Krishna. Of course, Arjuna knew Krishna was the Supreme Lord. But the, uh, somehow he's, you know, due to illusion, due to forgetfulness, he's thinking maybe he shouldn't fight. So Krishna tells him, I know you're going to fight anyway. Okay, text number 60. Can you read? Yes, please. Under illusion, you are now declining to act according to my direction, but compelled by the work born of your own nature, you will act all the same, O son of Kunti. Yes, he's going to act. Now, what's better, to act due to the modes of nature or to act according to the will of Krishna? That's the choice. If he, both ways he's going to act, he's going to fight. If one way he fights because Krishna told him to do it, other way he's going to fight, the modes of nature are going to impel him to do it. Now, it's obviously better that one will fight under Krishna's order, by the direction of Krishna. Don't want to think that, uh, oh, let me decide, uh, let me decide. No, we want to hear from Krishna and act according to Krishna's direction. Very important. Going ahead, text 61. Someone like to read? Yeah. Uh, the Supreme Lord is situated in everyone's heart, O Arjuna, and is directing the wandering of all living entities who are seated as on a machine made of material energy. So someone may say, Oh, we're all directed, Krishna's directing the wanderings of everyone. So I don't have to bother, I just leave everything to Krishna. How will you respond to that? Anybody answer? I'm saying that in this verse, Lord Krishna has said, he said, uh, he is directing the wanderings of all living entities. He's situated in everyone's heart and is directing the wanderings of all living entities. So someone may say, well, Krishna's in my heart. Krishna's directing everything. I don't need to decide anything. I just leave it to Krishna. I just do whatever Krishna in my heart tells me. So? So whatever happens to me, you know, it's Krishna's plan. It's all Krishna's arrangement. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm just a, a puppet in the hands of Krishna. So what will you say? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, is it that uh, the Lord directs according to one's desire? Yes. The desire. 
Yes, the, this, that is independence that one has. So he directs according to one's desire. Okay. So one, that we, we have two choices actually. Prabhupada explained, he said, uh, two kinds of direction. He said, and then Prabhupada quotes Bhagavad Gita, ye yatamam prapajanti. He says, uh, everyone is directing, that we're being directed according to our desire, as Maharaji said. So there are two kinds of direction. Right? One kind of direction is when you do not surrender and one kind of direction is when you have surrendered because these things are there. My position is either surrender or not surrender. So the not surrender person, he will get one kind of one direction and the surrendered soul will get another direction. Both ways there is direction. Right? It's, it's interesting. It's a good question. Somebody answers like, now this section, six, verses 61 to 63, we're hearing about how uh, we're being directed by the super soul, surrendering to the super soul. Text 61, up 62 and 63. They're describing about the here you can see also Krishna said I'm in everyone's heart. So he's talking about the super soul, which is his Lord Krishna's expansion. And he's directing the wandering. So he directs according to the desire of the living entity. And Prabhupada in the purport also he gives a, another example. He talks about uh, talks about, he said, as soon as a living entity is placed in a particular type of body, he has to work under the spell of that bodily, that bodily situation. And he says, a person who is in a high-speed motor car goes faster than one seated in a slower car. The living entities the drivers may be the same, but different cars. One is a high-speed sports car and the other is a slow car. So the same way, under the order of the Supreme Soul, material nature fashions a particular type of body to a particular type of living entity, so that he may work according to his past desires. Living entity is not independent. One should not think himself independent of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Individual is always under the Lord's control. Therefore, one's duty is to surrender, and that is the injunction of the next verse. All right? Maras, let yeah. Pranam. Yes. Can I just ask you a small thing, Maras? Okay. This 61 verse is almost uh, conveying the same uh, meaning of 50.50, Sarvasachatma, Prudhisanya Vishto, Matta Smriti, Jnana, Bhupohana, which one is the same as 1515? Ah, 1515. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So? Similar meaning, Maharaj. Which one? This 61. 61. Well, 61 is also talking about the super soul, yeah, within the hearts of all living entities. Yes. Yes, six, 61 is also talking about surrendering to the super soul. In the 15th chapter, we were discussing more about the maintenance of the, the, the how the super soul maintains everyone. In the 15th chapter, it was a little different. We were speaking about the super soul and how he's the maintainer in the universe. 
and how he maintains the living entity in the heart. He carries the desire to the next life and he also comes as Srila Vyasadev to write the scriptures to benefit the conditioned soul. Yeah? A little, little different, but again, you know, same talking about the super soul. So, example, the high-speed motor car is given there in the purpose of 61, right? We want to know that example and understand how to use it. Okay, so then going ahead, uh, text 62, I have to surrender unto him utterly, 62. O Sayan of Bharat, surrender unto him utterly. By his grace you will attain transcendental peace and the supreme and eternal abode. So Krishna is encouraging, Lord Krishna is encouraging, surrender, I have to surrender. Prabhupada writes, by such surrender, not only will one be released from all miseries in this life, but at the end he will reach the Supreme Goal, Supreme God. The transcendental world is described in Vedic literature. So like that, this idea why we should surrender, we want to go back to Godhead, to his abode. We have to be a surrendered soul. Going ahead, text 63, we hear about confidential. The word is used, confidential, right? Guyat, confidential. And then guyatamam, still more confidential. Reading text 63, thus I have explained to you knowledge still more confidential. Deliberate, deliberate on this fully and then do what you wish to do. So understand there is, there's different levels of knowledge. There is confidential knowledge. There is more confidential knowledge. And then there's the most confidential knowledge. So we had confidential knowledge with verse uh, like... 55, we heard about the Brahman, right? Brahma Buddha, that was confidential knowledge. Let's see, in the purport, Prabhupada writes. Yeah, Prabhupada says that the Lord has already, at the beginning of the purport, the Lord has already explained to Arjuna the knowledge of Brahma Bhutta. One who is in the Brahma Bhutta condition is joyful. He never laments, nor does he desire anything. That is due to confidential knowledge. Right? So this is confidential knowledge. Krishna also disclosed this knowledge of the super soul. This is also Brahman knowledge, knowledge of Brahman, but it is superior. Try to understand, knowledge of the super soul is also knowledge of Brahman, but it is superior to, simple, to simply knowledge of the Brahman. The super soul is also Brahman, but it's superior, a superior type of knowledge. So there's confidential knowledge, more confidential knowledge, and the most confidential knowledge is going to come. Text 64 describes, Because you are my very dear friend, I am speaking to you my supreme instruction, the most confidential knowledge of all. Please hear this from me, for it is for your benefit. Right? The most confidential knowledge. 
Prabhupada's purport of 64. The Lord has given Arjuna knowledge that is confidential, knowledge of Brahman, and still more confidential knowledge of the super soul within everyone's heart. And now he is giving the most confidential part of knowledge. Just surrender unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Right? This is the most confident. At the end of the ninth chapter he said, Manmana, just always think of me. The same instruction is repeated here to stress the essence of the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. All right, so text 65, the most confidential knowledge. Always think of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer homage unto me. Thus you will come to me without fail. I promise you this because you are my very dear friend. So Prabhupada explained, these four activities are really not very difficult. It's uh, asking people to think of Krishna. To think of Krishna, of course, you have, we have to hear. We have to hear about him in order to be able to think of Krishna. So hearing is also very important. And become a devotee. To become a devotee. Well, we're trying to become devotees. Devotion is in our heart. We have to awaken it. We're on the path. We should worship Krishna. How to worship Krishna? Well, we can chant the holy name. Offer your homage unto me. Yes, we could. Namaskuru. We can bow down before Krishna. Offer obeisances. That's not so difficult. Not so difficult for some people, but for some people it is difficult. They don't like to bow down, right? The young man said to Prabhupada, why I should bow down? I don't like to bow down. So Prabhupada explained to him, he said, you may not like to bow down, but you, you may not like to bow down to Lord Krishna, but you will be forced to bow down to old age and to disease and to death. You may not like it, but you will be forced to bow down to these things. But bowing down to Krishna frees you from old age, disease and death. You bow down before Krishna, and then you will no longer have to bow down to old age, disease and death. The devotees are happy to bow down to Krishna. You will not be happy when you bow down to old age, disease and death. So bowing, offering obeisances is a one part of the most confidential knowledge. All right. And Prabhupada explains. Uh, we'll read the second paragraph. These words stress that one should concentrate his mind upon Krishna, the very form with two hands carrying a flute, the bluish boy with a beautiful face and peacock feather in his hair. These are descriptions of Krishna found in the Brahma Samhita and other literatures. One should fix his mind on this original form of Godhead, Krishna. One should not even divert his attention to other forms of the Lord. The Lord has multi-forms as Vishnu, Narayan, Rama, Varaha, etc. But a devotee should concentrate his mind on the form that was present before Arjuna. Concentration of the mind on the form of Krishna can, constitutes the most confidential part of knowledge. And this is disclosed to Arjuna, because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna. So, very nice purport, Srila Prabhupada explaining. So, uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, he says that, Oh, Arjuna has heard Krishna speak these four things. So, he, says, he then says to Krishna, 
Oh, four things. Why not just give me one thing? You're telling me four things. Can you just tell me one thing? Make it easier for me? So, with that understanding, Lord Krishna speaks verse number 66. 66, which says, just do one thing, just surrender unto me. Give up all varieties of religion and surrender. I will deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. So surrender is described. Uh, there are six items of surrender which one should cultivate. And that's important. You should know that. These six items are mentioned in the purport. In the third paragraph of the purport, the process of surrender to Krishna is described in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, 11, 676. Right? Anukau yasya sankalpa pratikau yasya vajanam rakshishyasthiti vishvakso gopretri varanam tata atma nikshe pakarpanye sadvida sharanagati Sadvida Sharanagati, six times, six uh, items of surrender. First of all, Anuko Yasha Sankalpa, accepting what is favorable. So, what is favorable for devotional service? Any answers? Yes, anybody? You've got two handrails. One is Rishwari Mother, you want to say? Hello Krishna Lord. Actually I had uh, raised for another question, like asking question but I can answer. So favorite three things uh, like accepting prasadam and uh, doing uh, chanting and attending all programs, Mangalati and all these things. Yes, very good, right? And what's unfavorable? Unfavorable is like indulging and yeah, generally we simply say no meat, fish and eggs, no intoxication, no gambling, no illicit sex. These things have to be given up, right? That's like the, the basis, the basic philosophy. And what we need to accept, we need to accept the activities, devotion, kirtan, worship of the deities, and like that. All right, thank you. And then, uh, we should know that only Krishna can protect us. How will we depend on Krishna for protection? How are you going to do that? Anyone? Oh, just have it in mind, yeah? No, 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 we have to surrender and we should have that faith that because he has created everything, he will maintain us also. Okay. How do people in material world, how do they protect themselves? What do they do for protection? They use the um, facilities given in this universe for them protect or to use or they will uh, exploit the uh, uh, resources in the material nature. It was given by the law. 
yeah, they may have a bodyguard, or they may keep a big dog, or they may have insurance policies, you know, some insurance policies to protect them. Different, they have different ways for protection. They may pray to some demigod for protection. You know, when there's some epidemic, no, just like yeah, when there's... They are not the permanent uh, uh, this one, uh, protection. They are not permanent, they are temporary and... Uh... Yeah, ultimately they cannot give yes, long-lasting... Yes, ultimate protection. Mm -hmm. Okay, so only Krishna can protect and then only Krishna can maintain us. We can maintain ourselves only by the grace of Krishna. We see sometimes people, they worship demigods also. Oh, we want, Nanda Maharaj was going to worship Indra for rain. Krishna didn't want it. Just worship Krishna, just do devotional service. We don't need to worship any other gods. We just depend on Krishna. Krishna says, Yoga Kshema Vahami Aham. I carry what you like, I preserve what you have. Everything is given by the grace of Krishna. We don't need to worship other gods. Then we should have no desire other than the desire of Lord Krishna. That takes surrender. Of course, we have our different ideas, different ambitions, but we should simply accept what is Krishna's desire. And then we should always be meek and humble. So six items are described, taken from Hari Bhakti Vilas. Lord Krishna said, abandon all varieties of religion. Now, Krishna came to establish Dharma, but here Krishna is saying, give up all religion. Can someone explain? Is this contradiction? Anyone? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, religion means Dharma to Shakshat Bhagavad Pranitam. Whatever Krishna says, that is only religion. Other than that, everything is uh, non religion. So, as we discussed just now, uh, but just because it is not because of Kshatriya, Arjuna has to fight. And just because the Kauravas have done something wrong, so he has to fight. Because Krishna is telling them, so he has to fight. So, whatever Krishna says, that is religion, Maharaj. So, what religion is Krishna telling him to give up then? What is, why is he telling him to abandon religion? Um, because we are in illusion, we follow so many other things other than what Krishna has told. So, those things should be abandoned, Maharaj. Oh. oh, so he shouldn't abandon anything Krishna taught, but he should abandon everything else. What is wrong with the religion other people taught? Karuna Sindhu Prabhu, you want to explain? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So, whatever uh, isn't Dharma's told uh, Krishna is just to come to him. So, once you come to him, then just you have to surrender unto him. So, the, all these things are to reach him, Krishna, whatever Krishna told him throughout this Bhagavad Gita. So, once you reach him, then Krishna is telling that just uh, surrender unto me and don't uh, follow any other thing. Well, everything, everything comes from Krishna, everything comes from Krishna, so all of these different religions, they must also come from Krishna. But all of the things are motivated by Dharma, Arthur, Karma, Moksha. Only if you surrender to Krishna and think of Krishna, that is unmotivated. Okay, right. So the other philosophies are all materialistic philosophies. They're based on Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. 
So that's what should be given up, right? Yes, Mother. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. All right. So. What? I mean, the other devotees might have some points also. Yeah. Okay. Hi Krishna, uh, just an answer to this and also I have a question, like, uh, I mean, abandon all varieties of religion is also like the other religions as we discuss, they are binding and it's not the supreme and when Krishna has given the supreme knowledge, so that's what he's referring to, so if we surrender to Krishna, we will reach the supreme goal of, you know, his supreme abode. That's, and if we abandon the other religions because they are binding again and again in the material form. Okay, yes, thank you. I have one question if I can ask about that surrender. Okay. Um, the six steps of uh, the thing. Where it's this Rakshishyati Iti Vishwaso that only Krishna can protect us. Oftentimes we see, um, we as devotees, we face some, you know, some problems, some health issues or any adversities in life, though we understand that Krishna is the protector and maintainer, uh, still that fear and that um, you know, uh, the uncertainties still lies in our hearts and minds that, you know, we understand, oh, this is, you know, happened because of our purification and things like that. But still in the heart of hearts that one person or two, some percentage that is, a, oh, I mean, why I'm suffering like that? So why is that? That's because we still don't have that full faith on the Lord, even after practicing of, you know, such long time or less time, or where, where are we lacking actually? Well, we should have full faith in the Lord. We should have full faith that, you know, just depending on Him, the pure devotees will not ask Krishna, you know, when, when we're in difficulty, we simply depend on Krishna for protection. It's not that we have to pray to Krishna, protect me. But we see Lord Chaitanya, he also showed us, you know, going through Jarakanda forest, Lord Chaitanya, of course, he's not afraid, but he, he did sing Krishna Krishna Rakshamam, Krishna Krishna Pahimam. You know, he's praying to Krishna. You could say he's praying to Krishna, protect me. Or, but at least his, his revealing that his understanding is that Krishna will protect. Not that we have to ask Krishna to protect us, but we simply depend on Krishna for the protection. It will come. If Krishna wants to protect us, we say, if Krishna wants to kill someone, nobody can save him. And if Krishna wants someone to live, nobody can kill him. And so we understand it's all in Krishna's hands. We just have to surrender and see what is Krishna's plan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Queen Kunti had so many difficulties, but we don't see that she was actually praying. Uttara came and prayed to protect the child. She said, let it kill me, but just protect the child. So those are, this is the mood of the pure devotees. All right, any other questions before we go on? Maharaj, regarding the same thing, may I ask? Yes. Regarding the protection. Uh, I mean, uh, he explained about Queen Quinti and Uttara, uh, uh, like they were at the pure platform. Uh, they uh, didn't ask Krishna for protection and all, but uh, when some difficulties come to us, we do feel uh, distressed, and we f do feel troubled, and we um, uh, do need some protection. And, I mean, we do tend to pray to Krishna for protection. So, uh, what is the uh, right uh, attitude in this? Uh, in some calamities which one devotee faces, if he's not at the highest of the platform. Yes, certainly we can pray to Krishna for protection. 
It's good. It's purifying because by praying to Krishna for protection, we, we rem remember Krishna. It's bringing remembrance about Krishna. We need that. If, if the, the dangerous situation helps us to remember Krishna more, then it's very good. That was Queen Kunti's prayer. She understood that the dangers were helping her to be more Krishna conscious. And in the, in the prayers by Queen Kunti, it also mentions like that, that one who is in a dangerous situation, he gets greater care from Krishna. And the example is given like uh, Devaki and Vasudev, they were in the prison of Kamsa and their children had been killed by Kamsa. But Devaki had Vasudev, she still had her husband. So Krishna thought, you know, Devaki's okay, she's got her husband. But uh, Kunti, she had lost her husband. Maharaj Pandu had died, so she was left alone with the five children to bring up. So she gets more mercy from Krishna because she's in a more dangerous situation being alone. Well, Krishna will consider what is actually needed for that devotee. Is it, is it necessary for Lord Krishna to uh, arrange to remove the distress? Or Krishna may think this distress is good for the devotee, that it will help him to become more surrendered and to become more dependent on him. We may be thinking it's danger, but Krishna may be thinking this is very good for this devotee, that they're becoming detached, they're becoming more dependent on me, they're looking more towards me, and they're thinking less about their own material cir 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 circumstances. And so, what, you know, it's not going to be the same in every situation. It will be up to Krishna. He will consider what is actually good for that devotee. Ultimately, Lord Krishna's plan is to help all of us to go back to Godhead. So he's arranging for us all to get purification. And the purification may come about in some of the most painful ways. You know, just like in, in the sixth canto, you have the example Vritasura. Now, Vritasura previously had been Chitraketu, and he was cursed by Lord Shiva's wife to become a demon. But how did he respond? He simply said, thank you, mother. And he accepted the curse. And he got that body of Vritasura, and he's fighting as a demon. And he, Vritasura is described to be like the hero of the Bhagavatam that he's in that most obnoxious, horrible body of a big demon, fighting for the demons against the demigods, and Indra comes and cuts off his arms, and, and then Vritasura swallows Indra, and then Indra cuts his butt way out through the belly of Vritasura. <laughs> you know, so Vritasura is, you know, he's just in the mood of devotion, but whatever he's doing, you know, he does it without attachment to the results. And he accepts all the difficulties, all the dangers, he accepts it all. So, so pure devotees generally, they, they, they are reluctant to ask the Lord for service. But as you see, so I'm, I'm more, we're more, if we're more neophyte devotee, then we will, you know, depending on the situation we're in, we will approach the Lord with feeling and request for his help, you know, kindly help me in this dangerous situation. So it will depend on, it's up to the in, every individual how they respond to the dangerous situation. Some will ask the Lord to intervene and protect them, and others will simply want to remember the Lord and glorify the Lord. Let me not forget your lotus feet. If they're really very advanced devotees, you know, they simply take shelter of the lotus feet. 
whatever happens is going to happen, just let me remember the lotus feet of Lord Krishna. Is that all right, Prabhu? Just one small thing. I mean, in some in such situations, a uh, lot of remedies are also advised, advised even by devotees. I mean, certain kind of prayers to be recited. Um, in uh, certain uh, certain yajyas, English uh, nursing yajya, and all those things are also advised by devotees. So, what should the devotee do? I mean, go for them or like, what? Well. No harm, you go for them, yes, good. They're also purifying to recite different prayers and slokas. They can help us to remember the Lord and they invoke the mercy of the Lord. Reciting Vedic literature, we heard that's austerity in the mode of goodness. So certainly it's not wrong. You like to recite some prayers for protection, for your well-being. You can do it. But the pure devotees, they will simply want to glorify the Lord. Just like uh, Lord Brahma prays in the, you know, in Brahma Samhita. And when we pray that, when we greet the deities every morning, we put the prayers of Lord Brahma, Brahma Samhita. So Lord Brahma is not asking for anything. He's simply describing the glories of the Lord. He's describing the Lord's uh, appearance and his his abode and his pastimes. So it's not that because you pray you have to ask for something. You can just simply recite the prayers for purification. Okay. Maharaj, we have two Mataji's All right, yes. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, there is this regarding Vasana 61, where there is an analogy given by Prabhupada, like uh, a man sitting in a high speed motor travels uh, faster than the one in the lower speed. So uh, that is not very clear, Maharaj, if you can throw some light on that. Okay. Yeah, that's text number uh, 61. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, yeah, let me find it here. Yeah, right. Uh, in the purport, text 61, Prabhupada gives this example. Well, he's talking about the living entities in, in different bodies. People are placed in different bodies. And we're all placed in different bodies according to our qualification, but it's also according to the direction of the super soul. All the, Prabhupada said, all the activities of the living entities are directed by the super soul. The living entity gets what he deserves. So somebody's got the, you know, somebody's got a very good body, very healthy body, very strong body. Uh, somebody else has got the very weak body and, you know, and not such a nice situation in material life. Why? And of course, it, we know due to our past activities, the Lord places us in bodies according to our qualification, according to our pious and sinful activities. We're given a particular body. So Prabhupada gives the example about somebody's got a high-speed motor car and somebody else has got a slow car. You know, you, maybe you've got the little old car which doesn't go very fast and, you know, shakes a lot and makes a lot of noise. And somebody else has got this high-speed motor car which is really high-powered. So. Prabhupada com compares this to people who have different bodies. Someone's born in a, ro a royal family, or a, the fa they're born in the family of the very, very rich person, and they're very good looking, and very healthy, and very athletic. And somebody else, just the opposite, they're weak, and they're poor, and they don't get much education. So these bodies are like different motor cars. 
So somebody who's got a lot of money, they can get the big high-speed motor car, and somebody else who's not so wealthy, they have this a car, but it, it, it's much slower, it's just an economy car. Just, just, you know, not so expensive, just one of the cheaper cars on the market. So everything according to their means. So it's like, the, the car is like the body of the living entity. So the body shows our, it's a symbol, it, it represents our karma from the past. So the same way somebody's car is something like, it's a reflection of their karma, indicates a person's particular karma. Of course, we would think it indicates their economic status. Somebody's got a lot of money, they can buy a high-speed sports car, and somebody else, maybe you have a family and you, you don't have so much money, then you, you have a car, but it's not such a, it's, a, it's one, the, the budget car is much cheaper. So the bodies are like that. The body, the living entity's body is like a car. Yeah? So, Maharaj, the, this Prabhupada has also mentioned about the speed. So does that also have some significance in that? What does that indicate, speed? The seed? Speed, speed goes faster than oh, the, the one is lower car. <laughs> well, yeah, what... The, well, to me, it just indicates that, you know, different bodies, naturally different cars will go at different speeds. You've got a high-speed motor car. Why? Because you like to drive at high speeds. And somebody else has got the other car, which is a slower car. You can't go so fast. <laughs> it doesn't really make, make much difference. You have a high-speed motor car, you're, you're more likely to have an accident and maybe kill yourself because you've got the high-speed car. Much more dangerous to live in, in a high-speed motor car. There's so many dangers. The car goes so fast it overturns. But you drive a slow car, it, it's not so dangerous. You're not at so much risk. And so the, like that, material life is also like that. You have a lot of material facilities, you have a very strong body, a healthy body, you're much more inclined to sinful activities. You can easily become degraded, take up sinful life. And somebody's got a slower car, they're not going to get, they're not going to get speeding tickets, they won't get fined by the policeman, they don't go so fast. But, you know, they just follow the law. So. Somebody's, you know, poor and not, they're not so rich, not so good looking and not so strong. Yeah, they don't, they're not going to be so sensuous. They're not going to be so sinful. They will be probably more, sim more simple in their lifestyle and less inclined to sinful activities. So you could understand some implications from the speed in that sense. A high speed life, high speed life into sinful activities with a lot of fines, a lot of, <laughs> a lot of fines from the policeman. But the slow car, no problem. Yes, Maharaj. All right. Somebody else had a question? Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Number 62. So, in this one, uh, Krishna says that surrender unto Him utterly by His grace. Whereas in this whole chapter, He says that surrender unto me or about me or think of me, everything it is me. But only here it is given as Him. Is there any significance to that, Maharaj? Yes, uh, a little bit because what's happening when He says surrender unto me utterly, He's directly addressing Arjuna. It's a direct address to Arjuna, it's second person. Right? What, what text number is it? 62 Maharaj. 62 Okay, 62. Yes, right. Uh, as I remember, it's... Oh no, no, no. Surrender unto him utterly. No. 
Tam eva sharanam gachi, surrender unto him at all. Now that was a different one where it was him. There was one where it, it says surrender, it says him. No, in 57, where he talks, when, where Krishna said, just depend upon me, that is addressed to Arjuna, in 57. And then in 56, he talks about my pure devotee. So that is, he uses the third person there in 56 where he says, my pure devotee, it's the third person is implied. We re you really have to look at the Sanskrit to understand what is actually going on then in text. You say 62, this verse, uh, surrender unto... You really have to look at the Sanskrit and analyze properly what's going on, surrender unto me. You can't base too much just on the translation, because the translation, the important point is in the purport. You know, the translations can be the same in the, in the Mayavadi Bhagavad Gita, the impersonal commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. They may have exactly the same translation, but we have a very different purport. So, don't try to base too much just on the translations. Okay, my Hey, Krishna Maharaj. Hello, Sanat. Yes? Maharaj, I, I heard that in one of the lecture, you know, like in a 61, Krishna is saying that they both the Paramatma, he's saying as a Paramatma. Yes. And in the 62, he's referring to that Paramatma. That's what I heard. That Paramatma. Right, that Paramatma. You surrender on that Paramatma. So this will sometimes Krishna that kind of thing to indirectly he tells Krishna. Well, that's right. That's true. Text 61 to 63 are all about surrender to the Paramatma. Yes, so that is, that's a good point, Prabhu. Yeah, what's been talked about here we said this section 61 to 63, we're talking about surrender to the Paramatma. So where, it, where Krishna says surrender unto him, utterly it means surrender to the Super Soul. Right? And then Krishna is going to go on and talk about, uh, it will come, to, the most confidential knowledge was to surrender to me, Krishna. <laughs> become my... <laughs> but Maharaj, like, even the super soul is uh, Krishna himself, right? But maybe in a different... Uh, yes, different right. Yeah, it's a different manifestation. It's, it's the expansion of Krishna, yes. right? Yes. Right. It's a little different. It's a different feature of Krishna. Some people are devoted to the super soul. They don't give so much... attract. They're not so much attracted to Krishna, the person. They just attracted to the super soul, the Lord in the heart. Now, who is the, the Lord in the heart? Is usually Vishnu. Maybe Vishnu, four-armed Vishnu, but Lord Krishna is two-armed playing the flute with peacock feather and so on. It's a different feature. So, someone surrenders to the super soul. They're also devotees, but they're not like the devotees who are those people who are directly devoted to Krishna, the cowherd boy, the son of Nanda Maharaj, who's in Vrindavan. Right? Dhruva Maharaj, for example, Dhruva Maharaj, he meditated on the super soul.
Yes, so they can take up that one instruction, they can but directly become devotees, they can directly surrender to Krishna. They don't have to do anything else. Yes, this is Krishna consciousness. You take the lift up, immediately surrender everything. You don't have to go through preliminary stages, you don't have to study the Brahman and then Paramatma. You can immediately surrender. Okay, ma'am. That, this is a... Verse number 67, there is a bit of, uh, 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 like, uh, some confusion, like this comprehension knowledge thing. So, I, I also got a little confused, whether it should be uh, uh, preached to the people or not. Well, Prabhupada explains that devotees are more merciful than Krishna. Lord Krishna, is, he say, he's saying in 67, you know, don't preach to all, don't preach to this person, don't preach to those who are not austere or devoted or engaged in devotional service, nor to one who is envious of me. But devotee is more merciful. The devotee will preach to whoever will listen to him. If somebody will listen, then devotee will, we, will preach. Prabhupada said, devotee is more merciful than Krishna. Krishna makes that distinction, but devotee will he'll preach to everyone. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Dhanda. Maharaj, we still have Sachinandan Prabhu is raised again. Who he has to love Krishna? Yes, yes, Prabhu, yeah, if I can ask. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Maharaj, in, in this uh, verse number 66, in the first paragraph, if you read the first verse, I mean, Prabhupada is writing, the Lord has explained various types of knowledge and business of religion, knowledge of Supreme uh, Prabhupada. Uh, whatever Krishna has explained uh, uh, in the all previous chapter, Prabhupada is giving that. And now uh, he's writing, he is described in so many ways, different types of religion. Now, in summarizing Bhagavad Gita, Lord says, Arjuna should give up all the process that have been explained to him. And he will be surrendered to Krishna. So, what does he, what does Krishna, uh, Lord mean by that? Whatever he has explained in previous chapters or in the previous talk, Arjuna should give them up all, and, or what uh, Arjuna had been explained by uh, any, any XYZ person before the uh, Lord. What is Krishna mentioning to that? Yes, well, Lord Krishna is saying, you give up all these other processes. What was already mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, we know there was mention about uh, Astanga Yoga, there was mention about Jnana Yoga, there was Karma Yoga, right? These different things, they were all there. The Bhagavad Gita, many different yoga processes were described. So Lord Krishna is saying, Yoga, he explained the, uh, uh, that uh, Bhakti Yoga is how it, it is higher to all other Yogas. Yes. He also asked him, Arjuna to I mean, leave that, everything, everything, thing what he has explained. And then what is the meaning of surrender and to the Lord's instruction? He gave lots of instructions to the Lord's instruction. And he's again asking Arjuna to leave every such thing. Well, he's, he's asking Arjuna to just simply to follow this final instruction. 
just simply to surrender, to do what Krishna wants them to do, to take the instruction from Krishna. He, that, he, what does Krishna want them to do? Krishna, of course, wants them to fight. Well, remember, I said that from 65, in 65, Lord Krishna was telling him to do four things, yeah. right? So I said, Vishwanath uh, Chakravarti Thakur, a great Acharya in the line, he said, Arjuna said, asked Krishna, he said, just tell me one thing, instead of four things, just give me one thing to do. So Krishna spoke this one thing, just surrender unto me. That one thing will save you. Just uh, another uh, for my better understanding of this uh, regarding this Rakshasi Tiyushvasa. If I bring a, a, in a, a small case study, like a, a, a devotee, a Rasa devotee, or any of the devotees having certain problem in his life, which may be regarding not having a, a good progeny or not uh, uh, some life threatening situation or some situation with his near and dear husband, maybe with the husband or the wife or with the ch children sometimes and uh, so there can be various attitudes regard, uh, according to the different philosophies explained by Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. One is that uh, not, uh, I mean, uh, being, uh, uh, going to Krishna and praying to Krishna for his uh, remembrance in every situation and uh, be able to tolerate every situation which comes to uh, uh, the reactions of his own karma. One, one attitude can be, another attitude can be going to Krishna and praying to Krishna for uh, uh, remove, uh, to remove uh, the obstacle or to remove the problem. And the third attitude may be the going to Krishna and uh, praying to Krishna to find some cure of the problem or to help in finding some cure of the problem. And the fourth may be, I mean, being satisfied with uh, whatever situation he has and uh, continuing with his own uh, chanting and stuff. Uh, which which is is very difficult for him. So which which attitude? No, these attitude also changes according to various circumstances, depending on what the problem the devotee is facing. Uh, what is correctly advised? As we see in scriptures, sometimes uh, even in proper purpose, like in the case of uh, Bhagavatam fourth canto in Prithu Maharaj uh, uh, prayer. So it is Prabhupada mentioned that one should not pray to Krishna for any material thing. And simultaneously, we see in other ways like uh, the process of wonder and praying to Krishna is advertised. So what is the correct attitude and what we should follow or should try to invite? Well, as I explained to other devotees, you know, it's going to depend on the person and his situation. Someone who's very advanced, of course, they can just simply leave it to Krishna and accept whatever difficulties come. And someone else, we're, you know, we're not so advanced and we're maybe more attached and we're easily put into uh, anxiety according to our circumstances. And so we can pray to Krishna, please help me, please give me shelter at your lotus feet, let, re let me remember your lotus feet. Whatever may happen to me, let the difficulties come, but let me not forget you. Let me always remember that I am simply a particle of dust at your lotus feet. And please keep me under your shelter. So we can pray to Lord Krishna. We have so many nice prayers by wonderful devotees and acharyas. And we can repeat, just like, you know, we repeat some everyday shikshastikam prayers. You may repeat something from Bhagavad Gita. You can repeat the prayers of Queen Kunti. You can repeat the prayers of Gajendra. There are so many wonderful prayers to be offered. And we can recite the prayers given by these devotees. I think that's the best way to approach these difficulties when they come. We remember how these great devotees, how they reacted when they were in difficulty. Is there any great devotee, I mean, if you remember Draupadi, she asked, she prayed to Krishna for protection. So 
because there are also cases, I mean, even in Gajendra Moksha, Gajendra asked Sri Krishna for, uh, for I mean, relief of that. Uh, from yes, the yes. We have various situations with your devotees and you. Yes, uh, we have. Queen Kunti uh, asked Sri Krishna for more misery so that she can remain there. But there are other devotees who are praying to Krishna for protection and the removal of the misery. Uh -huh. so it is, uh, I mean, it's a little bit confusing what is the correct attitude because all these prayers have not prayed. The Jindra prayer or the prayer of Draupadi. Well, it's going to depend on one's level of spiritual advancement. For somebody who is still materially attached, then it's not, you know, it's, 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 it's expected you're going to pray to Krishna and it's actually good and it's purifying. If in your difficulty, if you're able to remember Krishna and pray to him, very good, nothing wrong. You know, we can't all be great saintly people that we never, that we, that we can just tolerate the difficulties and we don't get disturbed. Certainly we have to, we have to uh, understand our, our level of spiritual advancement, where we're at and what we're able to tolerate and what, and then based on that we know how we can, what we need to do. So to offer prayers to the Lord, you know, they may be offered asking the Lord for protection. That's, it's all right. That's, you know, it's not pure devotion, but it's devotion. It's just devotion mixed with some material desire, right? We call it karma mishra bhakti. So, okay, that's good. That's bhakti, but it's just, it's mixed with our material desires. So it's all right. You can pray like that. Yeah, we... Just like whatever level we have, whatever... Right, yeah, according to what level we have, right. Yeah, yeah. And Krishna knows, Krishna understands where we are, and Krishna understands that, oh yes, he's approaching me, he's in difficulty, he's approaching me, and Krishna helps. He reciprocates. We can't be artificial, try to be something we're not. All right. Any other questions there? We still have Maharaj, there are two more devotees who have raised hand and we got only Maharaj about 20 minutes. So we'll so just we quick, can... quickly go over the, the, the rest of the chapter and then we'll come back and take the questions, right? Okay, text number 68. Oh no, that was 66. Rabbi did 66. 67. Krishna speaks. 67, Lord Krishna is saying, who can get this knowledge and who cannot? Somebody is too attached. Not devotees. Krishna is quite, you know, he's quite strict about who to give the knowledge to, but devotees are more merciful. Krishna said, confidential knowledge should not be given to those who are not austere or devoted or engaged in devotional service, nor to one who is envious of me. But Prabhupada said, devotee will do it. 68. For one who explains the supreme secret to the devotees, pure devotional service is guaranteed, and at the end he will come back to me. So Krishna is describing the benefits of preaching. If you share this knowledge, you give it to others, then pure devotional service is guaranteed, and at the end you come back to me. There is no servant in this world more dear to me than he. Nor will there ever be one more dear. So this is the devotee who is giving that knowledge, who is sharing it with others. And I declare that he who studies this sacred conversation of, our, of ours worships me with his intelligence. So this is uh, samvidam, this uh, confidential conversation. Dharmyam samvadam. The conf confidential, sacred conversation. By studying it, we're worshipping Krishna. And one who listens with faith and without envy becomes free from sinful reactions and attains to the auspicious planet where the pure, where the pious dwell. 
one who just simply listens with faith, without envy. So they get great benefit. Seventy-two. O, o son of Prita, O conqueror of wealth, have you heard this with an, with an attentive mind? Are your, is your ignorance and illusion now dispelled? So Krishna asks a question and Arjuna says, Yes, my illusion is now gone. I have regained my memory by your mercy. I am now firm and free from doubt and I am prepared to act according to your instructions. Right? I am going to act according to your instruction. So Arjuna is satisfied. He's heard from Krishna and he's ready to act according to Krishna's instruction. And then a few more verses, just Sanjay speaking. And Sanjay, remember, he was telling everything to Dhritarashtra. Thus have I heard the conversation of two great souls, Krishna and Arjun. So wonderful is that message that my hair is standing on end. By the mercy of Vyas, I have heard these most confidential talks directly from the master of all mysticism, Krishna, who was speaking personally to Arjun. By the mercy of Vyas, that's the important point. You need to have the mercy of the spiritual master. And in this way, we can understand the, mercy, the message of Lord Krishna. So the mercy of Vyas was given there to Sanjay, and Sanjay was able to understand Lord Krishna speaking Bhagavad Gita. O oh Krishna, as I repeatedly recall this wonderful and holy dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, I take pleasure being thrilled at every moment. O oh King, as I remember the wonderful form of Krishna, I am struck with wonder more and more, and I rejoice again and again. And then the final verse, wherever there is Krishna, the master of all mystics, wherever there is Arjun, the supreme archer, there will also certainly be four things, opulence, victory, extraordinary power and morality. That is my opinion. So this, this is uh, Sanjay predicting victory for Krishna, for Arjuna, because although the Pandavas have a much smaller army, they have Lord Krishna on their side. They're going to be victorious. So Sanjay, he's heard the Bhagavad Gita and he's convinced Lord Krishna is going to bring the Pandavas to be victorious in this wonderful battle. All right, so we'll take the questions now. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Chandravamsi Prabhu, you had a question. Okay, Harshamadaji, you can go ahead. Or Chandravamsi Prabhu, I don't know. Hare Krishna. It's not a question. I had a comment on that Sarva Dharma Paritya Jaya. So, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita ends with that, and the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, first chapter, says Dharma Projita. Dharma Projita Kaitava. Dharma Kaitava Projita, that verse, it explains that the Kaitava Dharma is like giving up all materially motivated. There Prabhupada explains that Bhukti, Mukti and Siddhi. So all these should be, you know, like uh, given up. Okay. That, that yes. Was, uh, my comment. Very, very good. This is a good comment. Yes. Bhukti Mukti Siddhi Kami Sakale Ashanta Krishna Bhakti Nishkam Saish Ashanta Right? Yes, yes. Only the devotee's mind is peaceful. One who is doing Bhukti Mukti or Siddhi, their minds are not peaceful. Yes, because they are all doing Kaitava Dharma, cheating religion. But Krishna says, give up all this Kaitava Dharma. Yes. Just do pure devotion. Okay, very good. Good morning, 
I cannot hear you, Madhaji. I cannot hear you. Your voice is not clear. Can you speak up? A bit better, yes. Sorry, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, I have one Mataji who we attend Krishna Conscious lectures together, but her family does not want her to attend the classes. So they kind of stop her by doing certain type of black magic where her mind goes out of control. So there are many times when I'm asking her why I'm coming, she, she says, I don't want to come to you. So then uh, she says, Can I actually do Reiki healing. So she tells me, can you give me Reiki healing? I might be able to come. So then she's, ch she's chanting her rounds. So then when I try to clear her aura by healing, then she feels better than when she comes. So I have this doubt whether I should really do this or I mean, just ask her, just leave it on Krishna. Or but then I see, no, if this healing makes her feel better and makes her do devotional service, then I can't do it. So we both have this question. So your question is, should you go out of your way to try to help her to come to the program? Yes, to give her some healing. But she's doing Reiki, is it? She, uh, she's asking me to do for her because I, I do it sometimes. Oh, she wants you to do Reiki for her. Oh. Especially when the time she's not, uh, she's feeling mentally very disturbed. She's not ready to step out of the house. Uh -huh. Well, yes, if you want to. That's your kindness on her, if you want to give her association, that's your kindness on her. But she... I, I think I'm not, isn't Krishna protecting, we both want to go for classes, but she's not able to, so Krishna should protect, then I, there's confusion. Well, you, you could give her class yourself. When you, when you give her Reiki, at that time you can give her class. The class doesn't need a lot of people. If you have enough time, if you have enough time, you can give class when she comes to you. Or, uh, do you have to, does she, will she come to you or do you have to go to her? Okay. That's your kindness, that's your mercy on her. But this is not pure devotional service, Sorry, what? But this is not pure devotional service on her part and my part, right? Because we both are not surrendering to Krishna. Right. Yes. Yes, yeah, she's not yet devotee. She's not yet in devotional service, definitely. But you don't know. You don't know if she. She doesn't sound like a very good candidate. You know, people who get say they're affected by black magic and these things. I don't know. I, I, I haven't seen too many people get over this kind of stuff. When there's when they're on that platform that they're affected by some kind of black magic, then it's very difficult for them to actually get out of it and become Krishna conscious. Actually, then I know a couple of Mataji who are chanting 
such people and if I am giving them such feeling then sometimes even I feel weird now. <laughs> Yes, so you have, to, you have to protect yourself. But if you don't have any other people to preach to, then you might like to give her mercy. If you're not very busy, if you've got time, then you can, you know, you can put some time into her. It depends a lot on your own schedule. How much time do you have? Are you willing to spend time on her, to try to help her? It, I want to manage because I have seen my mother also affected by this. Who? My childhood, I have seen my mother. I have seen my mother suffering these problems from my childhood. So, I do feel a lot for her. Can... Your mother is also suffering from blank magic? Okay, well that's very good. So if you can get your mother, then maybe you can get this other lady to also chant and to read scriptures. You can try. Try for some time and see if it starts to have effect. You know, association is very important, very valuable. So if you have the time and you're willing to help her, then you can use your time to encourage her to take up reading and chanting. Yes? I'm, I'm not able to hear you again, Madhiji. You're, it's very soft and there's noise in the background. Well, Reiki is some material thing. I don't know about it. I, 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 it's not very useful for devotional service. It's not useful for devotional service. It's just some material, mystic thing, subtle science. It's not going to help us become Krishna conscious. But if somebody else wants it, if somebody else has some faith in it, and they, you, they come to you, it's an opportunity for you to give them Krishna consciousness. You can speak to them and talk to them about Krishna and let them have the, hear the holy name. But the Raki is not going to help make her a devotee. Yes, Thank you. All right, anybody else? Maharaj, Hindu Lekha Kripa Mataji has a question. Yes. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, this is regarding the text number 65, Manmana Bhava Madhvattu. Yes. The same has been uh, repeated before like in uh, 9.34. Yes. Is there any significance of that, why it has been repeated uh, twice like this? Maharaj? Because it's such an important instruction. Is there any difference or like uh, when he said, uh, when Krishna told this in the ninth chapter and again in the uh, 18th chapter, is there any difference or any context or anything like that? Maharaj? Well, in the, in the ninth chapter, he was giving us the most confidential knowledge. And here, in the 18th chapter, we were summarizing all the different teachings. And so we were, we were remember, we had Karma Yoga and then Jnana Yoga then the modes of nature, and then the varnas, and then we came to yes. Brahma Bhuta, and then we heard about surrender to the super soul. And then after surrender to the super soul, then we have this instruction, the most confidential knowledge. Yes. Maharaj, some of the devotees have a little bit difficulty on the Question 91 from the handbook, and they were 
asking me if he can if I can request you to explain give them some points and other things on that. I can read that question if you want Maharaj. Oh yeah, I have it here. Identify and discuss for personal and preaching application significant verses mentioned fifty four to seventy six. Is it to seventy eight? That yes, verse? Maharaj. You know yes, I, I think I understand that these questions won't be asked in your exam. I thought there's only a, there's only a few questions, I think, is it? Maharaj, Krishna Keshe Prabhu told us to prepare on this because this is going to be a 10 mark question. Oh, and really? He's, he, he thinks that it's going to be, they, they will be asking these questions, so devotees are really pushing to this. this okay, 50, so 54 to 78. 78 is the end of the chapter. <laughs> That's right, Maharaj, yeah. <laughs> Almost uh, uh, one quarter of the so, verses in... Uh, yeah, so significant verses <laughs> for personal and preaching application. Significant verses. All right, so 54 for personal and preaching. <laughs> I don't know how much you can say you don't want to pick out all the verses, but you could say 54 was bringing us to the platform of Brahman, right? So coming to the transcendental platform, realizing you're not the body, and devotional service begins from that Brahman platform. So that's important. And then after that, then the next significant verse will be uh, I would think the next significant verse will be uh, you could mention About 61, 62 and 63 are describing surrender to the Paramatma, right? And that's mentioned in six, particular 61, how the Lord is in the heart, directs everyone like a... Uh, he, we're like on a machine made of the material energy. Right? The living entities are seated on a machine made of the material energy. So the body is like a machine and we are the living entities and we are being directed by the Supreme Lord, by the Super Soul. So that realization of the Super Soul is being given there. That goes up to text 63. And 63 also mentions that more well 61 was confidential knowledge and then no no confidential knowledge was at 54 the brahman right then 61 is more confidential knowledge because we got knowledge about the super soul and then Krishna says about the most confidential knowledge, manmana bhava madbhakto madhyaji mam namaskaru. This is the most confident, most confidential knowledge. Sixty-five. That you're my pure devotee. And we should, then, we have 66. That in, why so many things? Why four things? Just one thing? So just surrender. Give up all religion, varieties of religion, or this uh, material religion. Material religion we give up and we just surrender to Krishna. So this surrender to Krishna is then given. And then next most important point which comes about, Krishna talks about preaching. Krishna glorifies the preachers 
that people who explain this knowledge to others, that they're very, very dear to Lord Krishna, and Krishna promises that at the end he will come back to me. So this is good. And then you could also state how Krishna describes this, uh, this dharmyam samvadam, dharmyam samvadam, this sacred conversation, that if we study this, we're worshipping Krishna by our intelligence. So that's a, also a nice thing for preaching about, that studying the Bhagavad Gita is worshipping Krishna by our intelligence. If people would just read the Bhagavad Gita and study it, and they're actually worshipping Krishna. You don't need to have deities, you don't need to have a big altar, just have this book and read this book. This is worship of Krishna by the intelligence. So Krishna's glorified preaching and then glorified, we heard about worshipping uh, Krishna by intelligence. And then the final thing comes at the end when Sanjay says, wherever there is Krishna and Arjun, then there is, oh, well, 72 is also, if you want, if you want to put everything in, you have, in 72, you have Arjuna saying that now I'm convinced, I'm going to do what you asked me to do. So the point here is that Krishna doesn't force Arjuna that I'm God, you have to do what I say. But Krishna gives free will and he is asking Arjuna, what are you going to do? Actually, where is that question? I don't, I forgot, it must have come up. Uh, Krishna t says to, he said, uh, it's up to you, Arjuna, what do you want to do? Which number is it? Which verse? Um, 63. 63. Uh, yeah, then do what, thank you, right, 63, right. Deliberate on this fully and do what you wish to do. So that was 63. That's also an important point that Krishna is telling Arjuna that it's up to you, as you like. Prabhupada in the purport there says, as you like, you may act. God does not interfere with the little independence of the living entity. Right? Very important. That's also an important point in this in final chapter here, that we have free will. Krishna gives us free will, that's an important point. And so then we see at the end, Arjuna saying, yeah, now I'm convinced I'm going to do what you told me. Karishe vachanam tava. I'm ready to act according to your instruction. Karishe vachanam tava. I will do as you, you ask. So Krishna gave free will to Arjuna and Arjuna, he surrendered and he wants to do what Krishna told him. And then at the end you have Sanjay's prediction, wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna there will be victory, opulence, morality, extraordinary power. So these things are very desirable everywhere, people would like very much. Victory, opulence, morality, extraordinary power. Very nice. So wherever there is Krishna and Arjuna, if we keep Krishna and Arjuna with us, these things will also be there with us. It's a great blessing, benediction. So in this way, you can ask, you can describe. Is it okay? Oh, thank you, Maharaj. That was it's really very helpful. Anybody has a, any questions on this particular? Anybody needs any? Before we take for other questions. Sachinandan Prabhu, you have a question on this? Uh, Any clear not, not particularly on this one, Prabhu. Uh, okay, just hold on. Uh, let's, yeah, let's hold on on this. Uh, Ananda Vijayas Prabhu, you have any question on this particular or clarification? Uh, not on this, Prabhu. I have another question. Okay, then uh, we'll go with Sachinandan Prabhu and then you can ask another question. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, and, and the words, uh, 67. Yes. 
uh, there's like uh, 67 and 68 uh, uh, Lord is asking that this confidential knowledge may never be explained to those who are not of share or devoted or engaged in devotional service, not to the one who is envious of me. Now, I mean, these aspects are present everywhere in every person. I mean, they, they may be uh, not or share, but these days the people are not or share, neither they are devoted and, and neither they are engaged in devotional service. And then in the next verse, Lord is saying that, uh, I may explain this knowledge uh, to my devotees, but he is very dear to me. So he's like uh, uh, pressing on the preaching movement. So, I mean, it appears to be a little contradictory between the two. Yes, well, Lord Krishna, Prabhupada explained, he said, Lord Krishna is very strict. He's, he's very strict about this knowledge, who he's going to give this knowledge to. But he says, devotees are more merciful. And the devotees will give it, they will distribute this knowledge to others without considering. Prabhupada explained, he said, we have public programs and just so long as somebody is not going to disturb, they're allowed to come. You know, we don't, we don't say, oh, you're not qualified, you can't come to class. But the main thing is just simply they will hear, they will not disturb. So that was Prabhupada's standard. Yes, uh, the idea is that Krishna consciousness is in everyone and it can be awakened by hearing. So we give everyone the chance to hear. And some fortunate people, they hear and Krishna consciousness will awaken and they will take a genuine interest. But there are people who are envious and challenging and so on. You know, when Prabhupada would come, when Prabhupada, you know, later on in his manifest pastimes, he, he wouldn't take questions because often people would ask challenging questions and questions which were not nice. So Prabhupada would say, you have questions, you ask these devotees. He didn't want to waste his time to hear some of the foolish questions. It's mentioned in the purport of text 71. In the purport of 71, Prabhupada writes here, why do such persons hold open class? Right? When, in the, or earlier he said, in other words, Bhagavad Gita is for the devotees only. But it so happens that sometimes the devotee of the Lord will hold open class. And in that class, not all the students are expected to be devotees. Why do such persons hold open class? It is explained here that although not everyone is a devotee, still there are many men who are not envious of Krishna. They have faith in him as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If such persons hear from a bona fide devotee about the Lord, the result is that they will become at once free from all sinful reactions and after that attain to the planetary system where all righteous persons are situated. Therefore, simply by hearing Bhagavad Gita, even a person who does not try to be a pure devotee attains the result of righteous activity. Thus, a pure devotee of the Lord gives everyone a chance to become free from all sinful reactions and to become a devotee of the Lord. Does that help make it clearer? Just one thing to that, Maharaj, uh, as uh, you said it about being envious of Krishna. Uh, now, in one sense, every living entity was in the material world. They came here because of that envy in them. So the uh, material, uh, that thing of envy is present in everyone. They, are, they were envious, they wanted to be enjoyed, and therefore they came. Yes. So in, uh, in that understanding, when everyone is envious of Krishna, 
Yes. Well, envy is the demon. The demon and the devotee are in everyone. We have to we have to suppress that demonic nature. We have to we have to know it. We have to starve it and get rid of it. So, uh, in that sense, it, the satisfaction of Krishna is kind of, I mean, uh, I was not able to understand it. Like, envy is there in everyone, and one is, to some level, uh, one is also not enough sure, and one is also not devoted. But the envy will be there in different degrees. Some people will be very out, outward, outwardly envious, and other people is just a little bit of envy. Yes, we're all envious of Krishna, because Krishna has more. Krishna has more wealth. Krishna has more knowledge, Krishna has more strength. He's Bhagavan. We envy people who have more than us. But there's different degrees of the envy. And how, who's going to act on that envy? You know, are you going to go out there and try to kill the person who's got more than you? Yeah. So we have to understand that envy can be changed, you see. That envy can be purified. We can develop love for Krishna by hearing. We have to understand. We are also part of Krishna. It's not that Krishna is our enemy. Krishna is our well-wisher. He's our friend. He's with us. So we can develop an appreciation for Krishna. We don't have to envy him. It's simply due to ignorance. So this envy is like that, because people are in the bodily platform, they envy. But when they're brought out of the bodily platform, then that envy can be completely nullified, lost. And uh, like, if you talk of the preacher, it also depends on the level, I mean, the, whether he's a Kanishta Adhikari, Madhyam Uttam. If one is a Uttam Adhikari, you can even bring the envious that he is having the envy of. A house very high in his envy to the path of devotion. If you think, if like, Uttam, like Srila Prabhupada must have done it a lot of times. So, yes, of, is of course. If is it, he can be brought to the path of devotion, but ultimately, uh, one is uh, always a part and parcel of Krishna. One does have, I mean, Krishna consciousness covered, every available entity does have. So your point is we we want to hear from Anuta from the Uttama Adhikari. No, no. The, my point is that uh, I, I was not able to understand this instruction properly because even if one is envious, they can be brought to the path of devotion. It depends uh, simultaneously on the level of envy and the level of the devotee who is preaching. Yes. So I was not able to understand this uh, instruction of Krishna not to preach to the envious. Okay. Now you're okay. And um, uh, just one last thing. Now, uh, Krishna, when uh, he asked Arjuna whether he has understood everything properly, and then Arjuna responded that I have understood my uh, illusion is gone, and now Karishwati Vashanam Kava. But uh, there was a level of Arjuna. He was uh, he understood Bhagavad Gita very swiftly, very fast, and uh, in a matter of one hour. But like we try to understand, uh, do Bhakti Shastri, read Bhagavad Gita, or hear it from other devotees, and we also see these characters from other devotees. But simultaneously, well, uh, it takes lots of time for a uh, common living entity to understand it properly and then to apply it properly. So, what is the I mean, instruction for us so that it can be understood and it can be applied? Because we, we are finishing the Bhagavad Gita study today. That's just thought came to me. Well, the instruction for us, it can be understood and it can be applied. Yes, we want to apply it. What, what was the instruction that Krishna said? You give this knowledge to others. You share it with others. One who gives this knowledge to others becomes very dear, most dear to me. So that's one instruction Lord Krishna has given us. He wants us to teach this knowledge, to share this knowledge with others and awaken them to understand the knowledge of this Bhagavad Gita. Krishna came to speak this. He's not just speaking for Arjuna. He's speaking for the benefit of the whole world. But he's asking all of us, if we have understood it, we sh as much as we have understood, we should be willing to distribute and share with others. I think that's the instruction. Right?
makes me have Ananda Lars Prabhu. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful uh, answer you were giving previously to us. Maharaj, on this, I had a practical preaching application question. Uh, here, Krishna tells Arjuna, in, in this specific verse you are showing, Krishna tells Arjuna that choose whatever you would like and you may act. Uh, uh, actually, uh, in my personal life, Maharaj, like when, when I was doing university preaching, we introduced many to Bhakti Yoga. And then, uh, but over the period of time, like they all went to different places. So there was not much contact. And uh, it sparked, a, like for some of them, it sparked a level of spirituality in them. But because there was no contact, they took up other paths, like not necessarily bhakti, but they took up other paths which they are more able to relate to and they write to us, oh, thank you because of your bhakti yoga sessions. It has benefited us in spirituality, but we are connected to this path. This path. So what? But I feel bad, oh, why didn't they come to bhakti? Like Krishna tells Arjuna here, okay, you choose what, but wouldn't... <laughs> How we, how we should react, Maharaj, like we should try them to get back to Bhakti or um, wouldn't even Krishna feel like this if Arjuna would have chosen something else? <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, this is a frustration which we often face in preaching, that we spend a lot of time, put a lot of energy into people and not everyone is always able to take up, take the... Uh, take up the part which we would like to see them do. We ha you have to think somehow how you can engage them, how you can somehow get some service from them. Somehow, if you can somehow activate them, you know, find some way in which you can make use of their, of them. You know, although they're active in something else, yeah, they've gone away, they're far, they're, they don't have the connection anymore, so you have to try to reconnect them. You know, it means you, 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 you make some arrangement, somehow you get them to come to where you are, or you go to where they are. That personal connection is very, really very important. People are often not strong enough to keep up their Krishna consciousness on their own and they meet other people and they get into something else. There's so many other things and it's easy for people to get lost. So how to bring them back to bhakti? Again, they need to get the association with the devotee. The personal contact is very important. You know, you try to invite them to come to the temple, get them to come and stay with you or something, or you go and stay with them. Somehow you've got to get in connection. Yes. But if they have gone so much into the other path, Maharaj, they have a guru now in the other path, so it becomes even more challenging. <laughs> Yeah. They try to now preach us in that way, oh, this is also good, <laughs> this is also good. So in this case, Maharaj, like if they try to preach to us in their path, Maharaj, then what our reaction should be, Maharaj? <laughs> well, you just have to tell them you're a bit busy, you don't have time to spend with them. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. You've got other things to do. Thank them very much. <laughs> when I have more time, I'll, I'll get in touch with you. <laughs> yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Thank you for that insight, Maharaj. It's yeah. very difficult, frustrating sometimes. Preaching is a thankless task. It's like Krishna told the gopis, you have to be thankful you know, you, 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 I can never repay you for what you've done. You have to be thankful yourself. You know, it, we got some engagement, we found some engagement preaching to them. They didn't take advantage, that was their bad luck. But, you know, for you, you got a, an opportunity to preach to them. And so there was no loss on your part. The loss is on their part. Yes, ma'am. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, so any further instructions Maharaj would like to give us? Oh, well, we just encourage you to continue this nice mood. You have to study Prabhupada's books and go ahead. After you study, then you, you teach it to others and you share it, right? That's what you want to do, take up the, the work, you know, but the, stu the students become the teachers and then you have to teach and share it to others. And in this way, give this knowledge, give more and more people a, an understanding and an, an appreciation of Bhagavad Gita. It's very nice. This is how, this is how you can please Lord Krishna. Try and abide by this uh, instruction, Maharaj, as much as possible. And uh, we like to thank you very much. Uh, does it, if anybody else has any com comments or anything, they will come. Okay. okay. Thank you all very much. Wish you all thank good you, luck. Thank you very much. I request everyone to put on your uh, audio also. And you can say three times Haribo, Maharaj. <laughs> Haribo, Haribo, Haribo. Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki! Thank you very much, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki!